So the final thing we're going to make today is going to be using a lot of SOPs that are the 3D surface operators. They're what we use when we want to do procedural 3D stuff. And we're going to do something cool where I have my mic being analyzed and that's driving the amplitude of some noise. So the louder I talk, the more noise there is. And the quieter I talk, the less noise there is. And then we're going to add a few effects to that and we'll talk about how to set up a little rendering setup as well as how to material a 3D object. So I'm going to go ahead and delete everything here and let's get started with the bare bones simple part of this. So the first thing we're going to do is make a sphere SOP. And as we saw in some of the kind of earlier stuff, SOPs are the 3D side of Touch Designer. That's where we work on 3D geometry. You can import models, you can generate models in geometry, you can do particle systems, all kinds of really cool stuff happen in SOPs. Now, the thing with SOPs is that they're procedural in that everything happens in little steps. So if you're coming from a background of C4D or Maya, maybe you're not used to the, the kind of really granular steps required to do every little piece of the puzzle to get SOPs kind of working. But if you start thinking about it the way we're approaching it with every other family of operators where you're kind of simplifying your ideas to like the smallest little steps that they can be, you'll have a lot of success with SOPs. So what we're going to do here is we have our sphere SOP. We're going to do a classic touch designer trick, which is to put a noise SOP after it which basically gives you this crazy blob because if we middle click on our sphere, we see 722 points in the sphere. And what this noise SOP does is it takes a noise value for every point and every frame applies them to that point. So essentially every single point is being moved and we can see its attribute is point position. So it's changing the point position of every point with a noise value every frame. And you'll notice that this type C period harmonic roughness, this might look familiar because if I make a noise chop, it's basically the exact same parameters. That's because this noise sump, just like I mentioned now, is generating noise for every point, every frame. So that's a cool little trick we can do. And then we can compound it with another similar trick, which is to make another noise sump. And this time, instead of adding noise to our point positions, we can actually add them to the diffuse colors, which essentially gives random colors to all the actual points themselves, to the point attributes. So this isn't a, a material, this is actually on the point attribute. Just know that. So now we got we got that set up, let's, let's put our trusty null at the end here. What if we wanted to control a little bit of this of this SOP kind of chain with something else. So we can go through and look and we can see that maybe changing the amplitude might be cool because what we can do is, is basically pulse this amplitude based on some music. So in my case, instead of using music, I'm going to use my microphone, but it could be really cool if you connected this to a kick drum, you know, of, of a track, if you're VJing, uh, that could be like a really cool generative effect. So what I'm going to do first is go to my chops, use an audio device in, this will give me the incoming audio from my microphone. If you wanted to use an audio file in instead, this comes with a kind of techno-y minimal track that you can use for testing with music. And what we're going to do with this chop is basically we're going to analyze the audio a little bit and then do what we've always been doing, which is referencing it onto a parameter. So the best way to approach things like this, especially when it's signals from the outside world, is I use something called a trail chop. And trail is very helpful because what it does is it allows you to plug in other operators and it shows you their change in signal over time. So you can see as I'm talking, we can see kind of that, that data being displayed. But what's really nice is we can also see the general values of that signal. So we can see my microphone in particular doesn't have that much gain. So it's actually only registering even at a maximum when I'm speaking pretty clearly and loudly around 0 0.4. So what I'm going to do now is first set up an analyze chop, which is going to take, you know, this value because, you know, maybe we haven't seen a crazy value like this with, with spiky red lines. And if I middle click on it to get a little bit more information, we can see that first of all, the sample rate is 44,100, which is a really common sample rate for audio. 
but it's, you don't really want to be like sampling video signals at 44,100. So that's like our first little thing that we're trying to fix. As well, if we look here, we can see we have 735i. And i is the short form for samples when it's talking about units. You know, f is for frame, s is for seconds, and i is for samples. And we can see it has 735 samples, which are not very useful because we just want one sample. We just want like one number to come through. So analyze chop is really useful because what it'll do is it'll take this audio signal with a fast kind of sample rate and, and tons of little samples inside of it. And it'll give us a good old fashioned one sample, one channel at the sample rate that we're kind of working at now. And on top of that, what it'll do is it'll give us a few different functions that we can use to analyze it. So if you come from an RM, uh, from a music or audio background, you might recognize things like RMS. Uh, you can check the indexes of the lowest peaks, the highest peaks. You can sum it. You can get the average. You can get the maximum. For this case, what if we didn't know what we wanted to get? So what I could do is I could use a trail chop to just experiment and see which ones might be helpful. So what I'll do is I'll first unhook my audio directly from here, and I'll just hook up my analyze chop to my trail. So we can see as I'm talking, we can see that if I talk really long for a really long time, the value stays high. But if I go quiet for a minute, kind of just relaxes. So maybe average is not great here. I could try RMS, but probably what I actually want is just the peaks of me talking. So we can see here every time I say something kind of sharp or loud, we can get those peaks. And I think that's going to be a better kind of driver for this effect that we're trying to use is just when those peaks happen, how can we use them? So if we have that, what we can do is we can even just skip to getting a little bit of visual feedback and iteration. So what I'll do is first I'll make my null chop. And then I'll go to my noise. We know we want to control amplitude. And I'll just plug this using our kind of drag and drop reference system as we always do directly into that. And now you can see as I'm speaking, the sphere gets a little bit of noise. But depending on what kind of aesthetic you want, for me, this it doesn't feel like it's doing enough. And you can see the, the slider here is barely moving. And that's because if we also look at our trail chop, we can see that our the value coming out of the analyze really is only from about 0 to, on general, maybe 0 0.2, maybe 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 if I speak loudly. So you know what we'll do is, is what we always do, which is range it. So I'll add a math chop. I'll go to my range tab. Now, in this case, I know my from range is roughly 0 to 0 0.2. And then what I want that range to be is 0 to 1. So now if I go ahead and plug in this new math chop to my first input of the trail, you'll see all of a sudden I'm getting much higher values from my, from my signal here. It's not just 0 to 0 0.2, it's actually 0 to 1, sometimes even going above 1. And if we go down and look at our noise chop here, we'll see that basically every time I'm speaking, we're actually getting a lot more amplitude out of the noise sop. Now, one thing you also might want to do is, is this kind of looks like it's, it's really energetic and frenetic. Maybe we want to do something we did before, which was use a lag chop and just smooth out the, the attack and delay and kind of ramp down of that value. So what I could do after my math chop is add another lag. And like we did earlier, for personal preference, I usually like it when the upwards value has a sharp attack. That way you have an immediate reaction to something like the sound. But then I actually like putting a little bit of a slower decay on that. So maybe 0 0.3. And what this will do, so if we plug this into our trail chop now, we'll see that we still have the sharp attacks, but the ramp downs are a lot smoother. So if I plug my non-lagged value, we'll see that there's a lot of these kind of extra peaks and valleys that we're getting, and it's kind of making the, the noise a little too, too spasmy for my liking. Whereas this, 
We can see as I'm speaking, there's still a few peaks, but in general, it kind of spikes up and then has a nice ramp down. And then if I look at my noise as I'm speaking, it seems a bit more natural, kind of matches what's going on in, with my voice a little bit better, and it's not as kind of hectic and chaotic. So with that said, we have our SOPs. And, this, and one of the tricky things for new users is, well, I have some like SOP thing that I like, but how do I actually get this on the screen? How do I render it? How do I texture it with materials? Uh, it can kind of be a little bit of a daunting process for new users. So there's a couple of different steps involved, and we're going to start with the simplest. It's that first, we actually have to make a little bit of a rendering setup. Because like we said before, when we we're talking about all the different operator families, SOPs are specifically for dealing with 3D data. 3D surfaces, meshes, point positions. And these viewers, like I was kind of talking about earlier, only display that data for you in, in like a nice way that contextually makes sense. But there is no content here that I could just drag and drop onto my screen. I actually have to render it down to 2D. So I have to render it into a top format because screens can only really display to they have pixels on them and the pixels have values. And I need to give that screen pixel data. I need to give it a 2D texture to display. So I have to take this 3D thing that I have going on and turn it into a 2D texture that I can then plug into a screen. So if I was going to do that, first thing I would probably do is go to my tops, grab my render top here. And then you'll notice that it has a bunch of things that it's, the parameters are looking for, cameras, geometry, lights. So we kind of have to set up a real traditional rendering setup. We need a camera, we need what we're going to render, and then lights. Lights aren't mandatory, but for this case, we'll use them because it looks a little bit nicer. Now, let's get the easy one out of the way. I can just double click here, go to comps, and now we're starting to work with these 3D object comps we were talking about earlier, You know where the panels were kind of UI elements, other had a bunch of other stuff. 3D objects are kind of our rendering elements, our, you know the little helper components we need for rendering. So one of them is going to be a camera. So we can just go ahead and drop that in. You can see it automatically gets referenced by the render because the render by default is looking for a camera named Cam1. And coincidentally, by default, if we just make a new camera, it's going to be called Cam1. So that's nice. That works. It's already in a position 0, 0, 005 on the Z on the Z axis. That should be fine for our purposes. So now we need to tell the render what geometry we want to render. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because it's it's you have to understand kind of the concept of how it works. Because you can't just take, you know, we've been calling this geometry because it is geometry, but you can't just take this and drop it on geometry because it's not going to work. You can see there's no reference happening. The render is just confused. It's like, what, why would you give me that operator? What the, so I'm going to set that back to a, a star. So it's a wild card. It'll grab all the geometry. What we need to do is use another one of our component helpers called a geometry comp. And you can see when I create a geometry comp, by default, it has this little torus in it and I can activate the viewer and, and look around. And the geometry comp exists, and what it does is it basically uploads, you know, on the on the back end kind of nitty gritty side, it's the transition from SOPs being on the CPU to moving that data to the GPU. But for all intents and purposes for, for your kind of thought process, the way you should think about it is that SOPs are where you actually work on your 3D geometry. And when it's time to come to render them, what you want to do is put the final kind of SOP that you have inside of a geometry and mark it to be rendered. And then the geometry is kind of just like your, your little holder for the things you want rendered so that everything else gets ignored. So what we could do here is let's say we have this null, we want it to be rendered. We made our geometry comp. What I'm going to do is go inside of this geometry comp. I'm going to take this torus and delete it. And then what I'm going to do is make an in SOP. Similar to how we did with in tops and in chops before, I'm going to make an in SOP. I'm going to go up a level again. I'm going to plug my null into that. So that way, when I go inside of it now, I'll see my null, my, my kind of geometry inside of this in. Now, 
we talked about flags a little bit earlier when we were talking about with tops and you know with tops we said if you click that display flag it puts it in the background and other families of operators have their own kinds of flags sops have flags that are you know the two of them that you're probably going to use most of all are the display and the render and those are the two bottom right side ones and what happens is when you turn on the display flag so i'll turn off the render one for now but turning on the display flag and if I go up a, a level, you'll see that now it's being displayed in the viewers of the camera, the geometry. Once I make a light, it'll be displayed there. That display flag tells the other comps that they can now you know, visibly display this geometry. If I turn that off and go up a level, you see it disappears. So I'll turn that on. That's usually like your go-to is you always turn that one on. Now we also have a, a flag here for rendering and this one when you turn it on and we go up a level, we won't see anything because we don't have a light yet, but that one tells the render and the geometry. Well, mainly it tells the geometry that this one SOP that I have inside of, of, of kind of my network, this is gonna be what's rendered. And you can have multiple things inside of geometry with their render flags on, but usually it's best to just keep it kind of one per geometry just so that your network's a little bit cleaner and more organized. So once we have this marked for display and render, What's happening is we're doing our SOP work here. We're passing it into the geometry. It's getting marked for display and render, which then basically feed it behind the scenes from the SOP level into the geometry, which then takes it into the kind of GPU side of things. And then from there, the render is able to, to, to look at it and rasterize it and turn it into a 2D texture. So the only thing we're really missing for this is a light. So I might as well just go ahead and create my light here back in the components, light, and you can see now we have this same kind of little scene here being rendered in 2D inside of an actual texture. Now, what you'll notice is, you know, we're starting to work with these families and it's a little bit tricky to kind of grasp the differences. But what you'll see is, you know, the main difference is that these are 3D. This is just 3D data being visualized. And you can see if we open that viewer, we can spin around it. We can zoom in. We can zoom out. We can do all kinds of different things. But... Once it's rendered, and if I activate this viewer, it's just a 2D texture. We can zoom in and zoom out, but we can't like spin around the 3D model or anything like that. It's just a texture that we can kind of pan around on and zoom in. And that's what we need for our screen. So this whole process here of rendering down our 3D geometry and content into 2D is what happens behind the scenes in all applications anyways. Just in those applications, you maybe don't have to do it yourself, which in some cases means you don't have as much control and flexibility to do whatever you want. So in this case, our camera here, all of the default settings for camera, geometry, light, and render will usually put your object in kind of the middle of the screen. If for some reason you're kind of experimenting and you don't see it, it's worth doing something like, you know, going back to what we we're saying, you can middle click on the operator, see what the size is, where the center of it is, because maybe your camera isn't far enough away or maybe the camera's too close. So you can go here, take a look at the translate, move the camera position a little bit, either make it closer or zoom out, or maybe you have to move it around. And you can do the same thing for lights here. We can say, okay, well, right now the light is at zero, zero, 010. And if we imagine kind of in our, in our head, we have geometry at zero, zero, zero. Light is at zero, zero, 010 and cameras at 005. So essentially we have our geometry in the middle of the scene. Then we have the camera five units kind of, you know, on the plus on the Z axis. And then five more units, we have a light behind the camera shining on that object. So we could even do things like if we go to our light, we could say, okay, well, I'm actually gonna put the light a little bit to the left, maybe highlight the left side of my object more than the right side. And then I'll actually bring the light closer to the object. So it kind of looks like one of those, uh, you know, those earth silhouettes where you see half of it and you don't see the other half because it's not lit. So you can get creative with this, but essentially this is kind of that basic rendering setup where you, you work on your SOPs, you send it into a geometry. Inside of the geometry, you have to mark the SOP you want to be rendered and displayed by activating the two flags. You then make your little rendering setup of a camera, geometry, light, and render. And then essentially you can, you can output this and we'll talk about outputting content uh, very shortly. But the final thing we wanna look at is, is a, an important part of 3D 
workflows and, and working with SOPs is, is going to be texturing. You know, you might have a model that you're importing or you have some kind of geometry and maybe you don't want to have this noise. So maybe we'll delete this color noise. Maybe you have this kind of 3D object, but you actually have a movie file that you want to apply as a texture to this, to this crazy sphere. So that's where the family of mats come in because SOPs basically do our 3D work and mats, you can see there's, there's only a small handful. They're really just in charge of adding materials to our 3D. The one that you're probably gonna be using most often will either be constant material, which is basically just an easy way to give things constant color. Uh, maybe if you're applying a movie and you don't want light to affect it to a texture, you use constant. A fong is kind of the, the other general one. That one is basically like a constant, but it has light and shadows and those kind of things. PBR you might use uh, for physically based rendering, you know, if you're working with substance designer, things like this. For now, we're gonna use a fong. That's kind of a, a real standard one. And what I'll do is I'll move my light just a little bit up here so I have room for my material. Because what happens is the material gets applied to the geometry comp, and that's at that point where it gets textured. So for example, if I take this fong, and you can see it's got lots and lots, it's got parameters for days. For the most part, we don't need to worry about a lot of them for simple use cases. You just need to know a few. But let's say we want to just apply this fong to the geometry, which is not going to do anything because it's already white. But what we would do is go to the geometry, go to the render page of the parameters, and you see we have one for material. And in this case, what we do is we can just take this fong and drag and drop it right on the material. Now this material is applied to our geometry, but because it's plain, it, we didn't really see anything visible. So what we could do is, is let's say we wanted to take a movie file and apply it to this geometry. So first I would start simply like we did before. I'd make a movie file in top. Let me change the content to something that maybe is a little easier to see. So I can take maybe this cloudy ocean little texture. That seems pretty nice. As always, I'll put a null afterwards because uh, that's what just good people do in the world. Then I can go to my fong and I can find this color map parameter. This is basically how you take any 2D texture, whether it's a movie, an image, something you're generating, but essentially this is how you take a top texture and apply it to the geometry as a color. So I'll take this null three and I'll drag and drop it onto color map. And once I do that, you can see all of a sudden my, you know, my little sphere thing here has that cloudy texture mapped onto it. Now you can see I can go in the geometry viewer, activate it, and it functions similarly to a SOP viewer. I can kind of like spin around it, look around, see how the texture is working. Maybe I want to change the texture. So I'll go back to my movie file. What if I went to the nature clips again, maybe put on some running water. So that seems a little bit more interesting maybe. Check, check, mic check, check. So that seems that seems like a, a more interesting thing, but essentially that that's kind of the process that you would use when you're working with SOPs in 3D. You kind of generate some 3D objects, do a little bit of work on them, plug them into a, a geometry comp, turn on the flags, set up your render setup with a render, top, camera, light, and your geometry, set up kind of a material, uh, if you wanted a, a texture, you could kind of use a fong. The alternative, like I was saying, you could use a constant mat. Constant is nice because what I could do is just say, you know, go back to my geometry where the material is, drag and drop constant on it. And in this case, you'll see it's a constant white. So lighting doesn't affect it, which is actually why it doesn't look 3D anymore because it doesn't have depth that kind of gets created by light. Every point is equally white. So I think this fong is a little bit more interesting, so we'll leave that on there. And then there's one final trick that you should know about this, because first, it's important to understand how this works. But there is a slightly easier way to do one of the steps, and that's this geometry comp step. So when I did it here to kind of explain it, I created one, we went inside, we made our insop, we turned on the flags. But there's actually a really handy way you can do this in just a couple of clicks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete my geometry. And the trick to do here is that if you have your final null SOP of your kind of operations, you can hover your mouse over the output. You can do a right click on that output 
you can go to the comp page, click geometry and drop it in. And that'll basically automate a bunch of the steps that we just did. It'll create a geometry comp. It puts the in SOP in here. It also makes an out SOP, but not very important, but it makes one. And then it sets the correct display and render flags for you so that it would appear inside of a render. Then you can go ahead and apply your material and you'd be in the same place. But it's important to understand because a lot of the time, maybe you're going to be working with more complicated systems and that kind of right click on the output method maybe won't work for you. So it's important to know what's happening inside of here, but also that there is an easier way to make it. So with that said, we kind of covered all of the operator families at like a really high level and just worked with them on little kind of projects. The final thing we're going to look at is how to output a little bit of content so that whatever you're making, you can display it on some screens or projectors. So let's take a look at that.